Hi friends, welcome to Common Grace. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm so glad that you're here on this fourth week of Advent. Uh, today we are going to light all of the outside candles of our Advent wreath, and then on Christmas Eve we will light the, the middle white one. Uh, today we talk about love and God's invitation for us to experience love and what we will receive, but also what that will require from us if we are to say yes. As we draw closer to that, I want you to hear these words on, from Psalm uh, 89. I will sing of the Lord's loyal love forever. I will proclaim your faithfulness with my own mouth from one generation to next. That's why I say that your love stands firm forever. Your faithfulness is, is, is as firm as the heavens. Friends, we began this Advent journey at the end of last month by lighting the candle of hope which reminds us that we are a people who live and exist in the hope of Christ, that we uh, receive hope from his last coming and we look ahead to the next coming of Christ. We then lit the candle of peace, which is an important reminder in a world that feels so divided and divisive and chaotic. God offers us a peace that surpasses all understanding. Last week, it was the candle of joy which is for us a reminder that God offers a joy that, that uh, goes uh, beyond happiness, that is offered to us at all times, that we can experience even in the interim and the incomplete. And today we light the candle of love, reminding us that Christ is the embodiment of love and God's never failing commitment to us. Would you join me in prayer? Holy and gracious God, we, we give you thanks for the reminder that your love never ends. We give you thanks for sending Jesus to be here with us, to teach us about your love. Help us to share that love with others this day and always. Amen. Let's continue by singing and worship. to roll over my bones Sorrow comes to steal the joy I own the Brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stay changed. 
Hello everyone, I'm Stacy, and I can't believe it. It's almost here. After all the hustle and bustle, we are finally in the week of Christmas. And there is so much to celebrate, right? I mean, Christmas cookies, seeing family we haven't seen for a while, Christmas carols 24 seven, and the presents. So much to celebrate. But you know, and I know, the biggest reason to celebrate. And it's bigger than all the cookies and songs, and yes, even bigger than the presents. And I'm sure you've heard this story before, but if you're like me, you never tire of hearing it. And it is a story of love. And that's why on our countdown to Christmas in this week four, on the Advent wreath, we are lighting the candle of love. We know that Mary and her husband had to take a road trip to Bethlehem to be counted. And when they got there, every place in the town was filled. And so they had to take whatever they could get. And Jesus was born with some pretty unusual roommates. And his birth was announced with some pretty unusual messengers. Let's listen. Nearby shepherds were living in the fields, guarding their sheep at night. The Lord's angel stood before them. The Lord's glory shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, Don't be afraid. I bring good news to you, wonderful, joyous news for all people. Your Savior is born today in David's city. He is Christ the Lord. This is a sign for you. You will find a newborn baby wrapped snugly and lying in a manger. You see, in the beginning when God said, let there be light, there was already a plan for God to send baby Jesus to teach us about love. Because, you know, the world can be dark sometimes. People can be hurtful. Sickness can shut things down. Some days can just be really tough. And what do we do when that happens? Well, the shepherds watching their flocks at night over 2,000 years ago might have thought the same thing. And then the angels came. They shone their glory all around. They spoke of the good news of the joy that would be for all people. God had sent a savior, a baby. You see, this was no ordinary baby. This was God's own son. And he would grow up to teach people a new way to live. He would perform miracles and heal people who were sick. He would give his life to demonstrate the power of God's love. This baby, born on a dark night in Bethlehem, was the light of the world. Jesus is truly the reason that we can understand God's love and share that love with others. So this Christmas, while well, you sing songs and eat cookies and gather with your family and open presents, here's the one thing to remember. You can celebrate because God sent Jesus. God sent love. A love that we are now to go out into the world and share with everybody everywhere. I told you there was a bigger reason to celebrate than even Christmas. Have a wonderful celebration this week. Merry Christmas, and we'll see you next time. God rest you merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember Christ our Savior was born upon this day To save us all from Satan's power when we are gone astray Oh, tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh, tidings of comfort and joy From God our Heavenly Father this blessed angel came And unto certain shepherds brought tidings of the same How that in Bethlehem was born the Son of God by name Oh tidings of comfort and joy, comfort and joy Oh tidings of comfort and joy
light Glorious now behold him arise King and God and sacrifice Hallelujah, hallelujah Worship him God most high As we continue in worship, would you join with me in a brief prayer? Good and holy God, as we come this morning to reflect on love, we know that this is a gift that we can understand in pieces and parts, but that you offer us to uncover more about as we move through life. You offer us love. You offer to meet us anew in this season. Would you give us the courage and the self-awareness and the reflection? Would you enable us by your grace to say yes to that offer? We know, Lord God, that in this gift of love, uh, you will challenge us to let go of so much that we hold tightly to as we are concerned so much for ourselves, uh, for our own well-being, as we tend to look past the needs of our neighbors, as we prioritize things that we can hold on to and control, you invite us into a love which will undo us, which requires the letting go, but which is also the path towards the life that is truly life. Help lead us on that path, we ask. Help us be a people who are filled with hope, who experience a peace that surpasses understanding, that know a joy that doesn't change with circumstance, and that live to know more and more of that love that comes, that we celebrate in this season. God, as we look around us, we see that the world is, is not all merry and bright and all things are not aright. We think of those who have uh, lost loved ones and whose lives have been impacted by storms near and far, by natural disaster. God, we, we pray for your mercy to be known in those places. We pray for your presence to be known. May each one of us be aware, Lord God, that your heart breaks with the breaking hearts in this world. Help us to extend help and aid and support and comfort uh, to those who, who are suffering from those sorts of disasters and, and from all sorts of struggles that we know in our own lives. Give those who are grieving a sense of relief and comfort. Give those who are tired a sense of rest. Give those who feel alone and isolated in this holiday season the gift of your presence. God, move us into the world to share these things uh, with those who need it so badly. We pray for all those who struggle in this season and who go without and ask that you would put us to work building your kingdom in this place. For we know that as we do that, we'll be called deeper and deeper into love. This we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
I'm so grateful that you're here on this fourth Sunday of Advent as we move closer and closer to Christmas and to the promise, or maybe it feels like a threat at this point, uh, the truth that ready or not, Jesus is coming. So are you ready or not? This year, we're reminding ourselves of the truth that Christmas isn't canceled whether or not we get ready for it. The truth will be claimed, proclaimed again in word, in story, in song, and in sentiment that the intention of the divine is always and has always been bent towards participation and presence, towards peace and goodwill for all. That love will not, cannot, shall not be overcome by darkness even if we fail to recognize love on our own front step. So the question is how ready we'll be uh, to, to receive love and how ready we'll be to join with all of creation echoing and proclaiming grace that's coming to dwell with us. Love is the subject of our reflection this week and I want to read three bits of scripture all from Luke, all of them about Mary to see what her story can teach us about love. So if you're following along, we're going to begin in uh, chapter one of Luke's gospel uh, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent to God God, by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. I want to pause here. Uh, one of the things that we cannot miss if we pay attention to this story and indeed to, to all of the scriptures is that God often uh, uh, shows up in unexpected ways um, and, and unexpected people. Uh, Mary is among the luckier of those in the scriptural account uh, as far as an example of this uh, in, in, in so much as that is concerned. Moses sees a, a burning bush which presumably, as the story goes, he could have walked right by and completely missed. For Elijah, it's the sound of sheer silence that God shows up in. God comes in all of these unexpected ways. 
our story this time of year, uh, this Christmas story, is filled with the same sort of thing, with God showing up to unusual people. Uh, Elizabeth and Zachariah have God show up to them in an unexpected conception. Uh, God comes to Mary and Joseph. They're shepherds and angels, uh, foreign astrologers who, who are making a journey. It's all chock full of God coming in the unexpected. And it is perplexing. That's what the scripture says. Uh, Mary was perplexed. Mary wondered what sort of greeting this might be. When God shows up, the God who we say in 1 John uh, chapter 4, verse 8, is love, we're often left with Mary to ponder. Likely, friends, the same will be true for us anytime the invitation of love shows up. Uh, love will come in the face of the beggar on the corner. It will come in the invitation to pause and take notice. It will come in the nudge to choose the path of peace, to choose mercy instead of power. Let's pick up in our reading right there, beginning in verse 30. Lost my spot here. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel says to her, guess what? I've got a plan for you. There are great things that are planned that, that, that to happen. And presumably the angel pauses and looks at her expectantly saying, what do you think? She asks, how can this be? She knows biology. She knows her own story. And though she may be acquainted with the stories of God's miraculous and unexpected power, this feels like a little bit much. So we pick up on the scripture in verse 35. The angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son also. This is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your words. And the angel departed from her. Let it be with me as you have said, she says. Because God, from the beginning of time, even unto our day, has, has always been a respecter of free will, it seems to me, to follow God's character, that this proclamation from the angel to Mary is an invitation for her. And because we declare that God is love and true love can never be coercive, I think uh, it's safe to say that the poignant pauses in the angel's speeches are opportunities for, for Mary to give truthful and reflective uh, responses. In other words, I don't think her hand is being forced. Uh, the, the angel says, this is what will happen. And she says, let it be so. Generations of Christians have revered Mary for her willingness to participate with God in something that was far beyond her comprehension, to say yes to the invitation of love. It's as if the angel says, these are the things that have been planned. What says you? And Mary says, let it be with me as you have said. Notice she has agency. She has voice. She has choice. That's important because it's the character of love that when love shows up, it will not demand things from us. I want to say that again. It's the, the, the nature and the character of love that when love shows up, it will not demand things from us. It will, as we've already said, show up in uh, unexpected ways and places and times. It is always offered to us just as we are. And it, it will not demand from us, but, but it, will, uh, it will offer some things like radical reorientation that, that can sometimes be unsettling, interruptive, and, and significantly refocus our attention. It will call us beyond our small individual stories into the grand story of what God is doing in the world. It will invite us into all of that, but it will not demand it. The opportunity to, to respond will be ours to say yes or, or to say no. So are we prepared to say yes, even to something that calls us beyond our comfort and understanding of the world? Last week we read of Mary's visit to Elizabeth and the joy with which she was received. We wondered and we imagined what lies between the lines of the text and within Mary's heart, uh, between her courageous yes and her hitting the road to go visit her cousin. Is it doubt, excitement, questions, regret? Is it a sense of peace? 
She makes her way to Elizabeth and is met with affirmation and encouragement and blessing and joy, all those things that we talked about last week. And then Mary responds with the Magnifica, this, this song of blessing. And I want you to hear these words. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He scattered the proud in their thoughts, in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He's helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. Friends, when you hear that, do you notice the confidence with which Mary speaks? It may not be clear in our reading because of the translation of most of our Bibles, but as she talks about all of God's action and what it is that, that God has done all of those verbs are in the complete form, meaning that they have happened. They are done. They're not the perfect tense, which means that, that they are happening, ongoing, that it continues. So when she talks about God, she talks about what God has done. God looked on me and did great things for me. God showed strength. God scattered the, the, the proud, uh, brought down the powerful, lifted up the lowly. God filled the hungry, sent the rich away empty and helped Israel. God did all of those things. So two observations then about God's love in the world. First, saying yes to the invitation of love is joining with uh, the work of God that's going on around us, which is promised and unfolding and assured and yet is also incomplete. Advent is all about this. Saying yes to perfect love is to say with confidence what will become. Mary can speak with such confidence that God will do these things because she has encountered and said yes to a love that has been freely offered to her just as she are, as she is, excuse me. If Mary's yes is a radical one, then her prophetic vision and utterance of assurance about God's fidelity to God's word and promises is no less revolutionary. It is a gift that comes not only from Mary's own capacity or goodness or reflection or life or faithfulness. It's also a gift of grace that comes from God. She declares, she says in a long line of the prophetic tradition and to open uh, the message of Luke's gospel. She says all of these things that God has done with absolute assurance that it will take place. Second, Saying yes to this type of love will require all that we are. I think we're extended the offer over and over and over again in life to say yes to that offer is always going to be transformative. Mary is articulating a vision of living into this upside down reality of the world, the kingdom on earth as it is intended to be, rather than the world we experience of, of smaller kingdoms at endless war with one another. Mary speaks of the poor and downtrodden being lifted and of the proud and powerful being sent away. To declare this to be true means that we cannot live the same as we were before. To embrace and live this is going to require a turning from the places that we've been captured by the illusions and the seductions of our day. Richard Rohr talks about this in sort of a different way. He talks about the major P's, three major P's that are obstacles for us living into the power of the kingdom of God. And they are this, power, prestige, and possession. Mary, he says, refers to them as the proud, the mighty on their thrones, and the rich. To these, she says, God is routing and pulling down and sending away empty. Roar continues to say that we could easily take nine-tenths of what Jesus teaches and clearly align them under one of these three categories, our attachments to power, prestige, and possession. Those are our obstacles to living in the kingdom of God. Now, maybe it's easier for a poor peasant in an occupied people to let go of her attachments. But as far as I know, all people everywhere at all time have had them in one way or another. Love, when it shows up in its perfect form, 
will offer us an invitation. And a true yes to that offer of true love will be a journey that's lived out over time. It will be about a lifetime of, of required reorientation and recalibrations of everything about ourselves. All of this is happening in us as well as in the world around us. And all of it's about being turned upside down. This yes will require the releasing of so many of those attachments. It bears repeating from our message last week. And I want to revisit this in our last bit of reading on Mary. This is going to come from Luke 2, 19. Um, uh, let us uh, return to this idea um, of what it is that, that, that love is able to do and what it is that love won't do. Luke 2, 19 says, Mary treasured all of these things and pondered them in her heart. Love doesn't bring a, a clear roadmap. Love doesn't offer easy routes forward and endless smooth sailing. In the small stories and kingdoms of our day, we may not be deemed as successful or powerful or wise or respected if we say yes to this offer of love. Love will continue to lead us on a winding road deeper and deeper into the kingdom of God, deeper and deeper into our own true selves and deeper and deeper into love's own self. If it doesn't cost you, if it doesn't puzzle and perplex you, if it doesn't confound and confuse you, you might not be doing it right. And if it doesn't also liberate you and bless you, if it doesn't bring you into the life that is truly life, if it doesn't draw you more deeply into the peace that passes understanding, then too, you might not be doing it right. At risk of oversimplifying love or, or conflating this complex, multifaceted, and complicated gift of love with merely one piece, one sliver, one understanding of it, I want to share this illustration of a friend of mine. I have a friend who tells the story of how he and his wife came to know one another, how they began to talk and to date and eventually move into building a life together. By his own admission, uh, he was a bit of a wild child in college, a partier and a cut up, always up for stirring drama and causing trouble. He was carefree, which at times was fine, but other times got himself or, or other people hurt. And he met this woman with whom he became quite smitten. And their relationship built over time as they grew to know one another. One night at a, at a party in which he'd been particularly living fast and free, after a couple of drinks and a cigarette, he went to find his girlfriend upstairs and a conversation, a circle of conversation with many of their best friends. And he wrapped her up in a hug and he went in to kiss her and she held her hand up and stopped him and said, don't you come and kiss me with that mouth that just had a cigarette in it. He was a bit floored and caught off guard and he looked at his, around at his friends who mercifully were, were quiet and then she walked away. As he told me this story, he said that in that moment, he realized just, just immediately like that in a flash that everything had changed. He felt a change within himself because it wasn't really about the drinks and it wasn't about the cigarette. There was no demand in her words. There wasn't even a question. That simple statement from her was about him and who he was. And it was about her and who she was. And that if he wanted to be with her, he was going to have to respect her and himself. And he was going to have to honor her and himself and the community around them. She didn't say any of that, but he knew that was what was behind what she said. What she didn't do was threaten him. There was no requirement. There was no gauntlet thrown. There was no line in the sand. There was no drama. But what he understood in that moment was that there was an invitation. And if he said yes to it, the invitation would require a radical reorientation. It would require everything. Some 30 years later, my friend will tell you that he's still learning about her and himself and in the invitation that he said yes to that night in that house. And he's still experiencing the beauty of that journey. The invitation into true, full, and perfect love will be similar for us this Advent, except all the more complicated. For Mary, I think we learn this about perfect love, that it will demand nothing, but require everything. And it will ask us to continue 
as we are guided deeper and deeper into the good and divine core of the entire universe, it will ask us to say yes. And it will lead us as long as we keep saying yes. May we, with Mary, find courage to voice that yes to the invitation of love. Let's take a few moments for reflection. As we continue in worship, I want to invite you into a time to give of your gifts, tithes, and offerings. Know this, that in this season, uh, what we receive as a church community, we uh, use to, to bless the world. So it goes out from this place. Uh, we use it to make an impact all around the world through the United Methodist Church. So you can give generously and trust that it will make a difference to help transform the world, uh, to meet the needs of some of the most vulnerable and share the good news of Christ among us. So let us give with grateful hearts as we prepare to receive the gift of Christ and join together in this last song. great joy for every woman every man this will be a sign to you a baby born in Bethlehem come and worship do not be afraid company of angels Glory in the highest And on the earth peace among Those on who his favor rests Oh, come and worship Do not be afraid My soul, my soul Magnifies the Lord Unto you a child is born, unto us a son is given. Let every heart prepare its throne, let every nation under heaven. Oh, come and worship, do not be afraid. My soul, my soul, magnifies. Indeed, in this season, we celebrate the great and wonderful things that God has done for and in and through and among us. Our souls join with Mary's in magnifying the Lord and knowing that it will require everything from us. Let us be prepared to say yes to the offer of love. 
Let us be prepared to be transformed and be those who are in the business of transforming the world. Friends, I hope you'll take time in these next few days to make room for Christ. As we move towards Christmas Eve, I hope to see you in worship on Friday. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen.